This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. No need to remember case names. I've said it. We're still on contract law, and we're now looking at contract terms. And I've already explained to you the difference between uh, those terms that are fundamental to the contract uh, conditions and those that are superficial to the contract the warranties. And remember, uh, the victim of a breach of condition, a term which is a breach of condition, um, is entitled to treat the contract as discharged and sue for damages. If you're the victim of a breach of warranty, uh, then the contract does survive, but you can claim damages. So run out to contractual terms themselves and chit-chat about contractual terms. These may be express or implied. Express is where they are specifically addressed, either in writing or orally, although oral contracts are not recommended. So they may be express, but they may be implied. Express is where we specifically talk about them and write them into the contract or talk about them. But implied terms is where we don't actually mention them. Terms that, terms that are not actually mentioned at all. Never have crossed our minds so we can think about what would happen if. And yet it does happen, as it was famously said in Jurassic Park, as Jeff Goldblum, I think it was said in, in Jurassic Park, if it can happen, it will happen. Uh, and we need, therefore, a situation arises where we have not foreseen the situation. We need some way of resolving what should happen. And so we have implied terms into contracts. Express terms are those already agreed by the parties, maybe written in or simply agreed orally. Those are express. Implied terms may be judicially implied or maybe statutorily implied. They may be implied in the courts. The courts may take it upon themselves to say, listen, this doesn't make any sense unless, unless this were a term of the contract. That would be a judicially implied term. Statutorily implied is where statute actually says, no matter what it says in any agreement, whether it be oral or written, no matter what it says, these are statutorily implied terms. These will apply. And although you may exclude some, there's one particular one you can't exclude. Anyway, we'll get there. Judicially implied terms. Three of them. I've given you three here. And I'm not going to tell you the case names. I'll tell you the case names, but I'm not going to tell you the story. The cases are business efficacy, and that's the Moorcock. And business efficacy means we go to the court, we'll say, we're going to imply this term into the contract. Because if it isn't implied into the contract, if we continue to exclude it from the contract, the contract doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any commercial sense at all for somebody to ask somebody else to do something without there being this term involved. So for the sake of business efficacy, we're going to imply this term into a contract. And it's not a standard term, it's not something standard. It's just saying, yes, we imply that you must have implicitly agreed that this was going to be the case in the event that this happened. So a judicially implied term to give it business efficacy. The second one is trade custom. And if it's normal custom within the trade, within the business, that one party, when asking another party to do something, it's normal business that, that this will be a term of the contract. If we miss it off in a particular contract, then the court will say, no, it's customary that this type of term is included, so we are going to include it within this particular contract. And a course of trade, a course of trade between two parties. Um, Hillis and Arcos was about the supply of timber for two years, 1930 and 1931. And it said within the contract, the normal terms and conditions as to quality shall apply. But very general, that. There's no actual specifics involved in identifying what quality was 
quite acceptable. So timber was supplied throughout the whole 1930. And then at the start of 31, the buyer said, don't want any more. And the seller said, but we've got a two-year contract. And the, the buyer said, yeah, but with unspecific, in specific terms as to the quality of timber, and um, we think your timber's not up to standard. And they said, well, we're <laughs> sending you timber for a whole year, and you've accepted it. And they said, yeah, but we don't like it, sorry. So the supplier sued and said, the usual terms as to quality shall apply, and we've delivered for a full year, and now they're telling us that they don't like our quality. And the court said, no, you've got a, you've got a course of trade between you two, and you've accepted a whole year's worth of supply. Surely, so long as they continue to send the same quality timber, you have to accept that they have to go ahead of the contract. And that was what was decided in Hillis and Arcus. You couldn't opt out of the deal just because there was this vague term about the uh, quality of the timber to be supplied. Statutorily implied terms. These are primarily concerned, or contained, I'm sorry, primarily contained within sale of goods legislation. Supply of goods implied terms act. There's a specific piece of legislation called the Supply of Goods Implied Terms Act, which identifies that where a person is selling goods in the course of business and is selling them to a consumer, so in a consumer sale, the end user, therefore, these terms shall apply. And they, a term as to title, the seller is stating whether or not they actually do state, they're saying that these are my goods or I have the right to sell these goods. So there is a, a, a condition, implied term that says I have the right to sell these goods and therefore you shall get good title, good ownership of these goods. And that cannot be excluded. The term there, terms with title cannot be excluded in any contract, whether it's a consumer contract or a business contract with another, another company in business. You cannot deny that these are your goods that you're selling. You, you, if you're selling a profit, an item, to somebody else, you cannot deny that this is not, you cannot deny that it is not yours to sell. Satisfactory quality, it used to be merchantable quality, but the goods shall be of a quality that is satisfactory for the purpose. What purpose? If we have multi-purpose goods, as was the case in Brown and, Brown and Craig's, multi-use goods, then the goods supplied shall be fit for the use identified. But if you don't identify the use, and they didn't in Brown and Craig's, if you don't identify what you're going to use those goods for, then any quality will do as long as it's satisfactory for a purpose. If you specify the purpose, then the goods supplied must be satisfactory for the specified purpose. But if you don't specify, so long as they're satisfactory, so long as they can be used for something, then that's enough. Sample, a sale of goods is a sale of goods by sample. If a sample is offered for inspection, so you call along to me and say, um, I'm interested in buying some goods. And I say, well, funnily enough, I've got some here in the back room, uh, which I can bring out and show you the sort of, stuff that I'm prepared to sell. So you look at it and the sample is acceptable to you and I supply goods and they are in accordance with the sample, everything's fine. But if I supply goods and they deteriorate and that deterioration is the same as the sample deteriorates and that deterioration could have been discovered on a reasonable examination of the sample and you chose not to examine, then that's your fault. 
Here's a sample. There we are. Yes, okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'll deliver goods which are the same as the sample. And they will deteriorate, but I'm not going to tell you that. If I tell you that, if I if I offer you a sample for inspection and on a reasonable examination you could have seen the probable deterioration and you didn't reasonably examine, then that's your loss. You come in and ask and I say, I've got some in the back room. Do you want to have a look at them? And you say, no, no, I'm fine. I trust you to supply goods suitable for my needs. You don't look at them. If a sample is offered and you don't look, and I deliver goods that deteriorate in line with the sample in the back here, and you would have discovered it on a reasonable examination, it's your fault. So sale of goods is a sale of goods by sample. If a sample is offered for inspection, and it doesn't matter if you choose not to accept, and the implied term is the goods delivered will be exactly the same as the sample that was offered for inspection. If a sample is offered, inspect it. Description is the default category. A sale of goods by description is one where no sample is offered. If a sample is offered, that's a sale of goods by sample. If I describe the goods, but don't have a sample to show you or offer to show you, then that's a sale of goods by description. And the implied term here is that the goods that I deliver will be exactly the same as the goods that I describe. So if I describe goods as Georgian peanuts, Georgia, the state in America, if I describe those Georgian peanuts, and they're not, in fact, they're peanuts that have been grown in Hungary, European country, rather than American state, then I'm not delivering goods according to the description. And if you find out, then you can sue me. How would you find out? There are people who can tell a Georgian peanut from a Hungarian peanut from an Azerbaijani peanut, from a New Zealand peanut. There are people, sad, sad people, that can tell the difference. A peanut is a peanut, surely. No. Georgian one is quite different from the Hungarian one. There was a case recently where a motorbike was being sold and it was described as a 1941 motorbike. And in fact, it wasn't a 1941, even though its registration documents said it was a 1941 bike. It was a 1941 bike. It was in fact a 1934 motorbike. And the seller went on the information that was on the registration document and it said 1941 motorbike, Ducati motorbike and it was sold as such in good faith. Has the buyer suffered from a misrepresentation? The seller saying, making a statement, trying to induce the other into a contract, a pre-contractual statement, 1941 motorbike. Has the offer been shown to be wrong? What a tricky subject that is, what a tricky one. I don't think it's a misrepresentation because it wasn't made falsely. It was purely innocent. But an innocent misrepresentation, like a false representation, enables the victim, the injured party, to rescind and claim damages. So, those are our implied terms, statutory implied terms. And we can't exclude terms as to title, but we can exclude others. And here we are, exclusion clauses. Used in contracts in an attempt to eliminate or restrict or limit the extent of damages payable in the event of breach. 
But there are some basic rules. First of all, they must be communicated to the other party at the time the contract is entered into. In the case of Mark Ollie and Marlborough Court Hotel, Mr and Mrs Ollie were booking into the hotel. And next time you stay at a hotel, watch out for this, because I do. They were booking into the hotel, and they signed a register, and Bellboy took their cases up to the room, and he said, here's the windows, and onto the balcony, beautiful view, here's the bathroom, uh, and if you should ever need anything, um, let us know. And he went, he got his tip and he went. And as he shut the door, they said, look around, it's beautiful, isn't it lovely? Anyway, they were going down for dinner. And on the way down for dinner, they just got to the, to the door, opened it, and on the back of the door, it said, um, the hotel will not be responsible for any loss or damage to guests' property unless it's left at the hotel reception to be kept in the hotel safe. They went down for dinner. They came back, the room had been broken into, all Mrs. Ollie's jewellery had been stolen. They got out to the hotel and said, we have been broken into, all our jewellery has been stolen. And they said, sorry, look, there, behind the door, we're not responsible, sorry. So they sued. This exclusion clause, which limiting the liability of the hotel in the event of damage and event of loss, was held by the court to be ineffective because it should have been brought to the Ollie's attention at the time they were entering into the contract, as they were registering. When you next register at a hotel, look around in reception, and you likely will find an exclusion clause on a notice board, often with a couple of grammatical mistakes, unless, unless the guests have deposited their property and they'll spell there on T-H-E-R-E -E instead of T-H-E-I-R. But you will find it, probably. You also find it in car parks, on regular spaces around the car park. So the owners of the car park, or a hotel, if it's a hotel car, will not be responsible for any loss or damage to guests' cars, well, to their car, or their contents. It's not their response, it's not the hotel's responsibility. If you park your car, it's your risk that you're taking. Of course, you're covered by insurance, but it's your risk and it's not the hotel's liability. And you, I do, I look at these things. I was parking in a hotel, I was doing some lecturing in Bristol for financial training, and, and just by the financial training offices, there's a multi-story car park. I was there for the week, and I, I parked the car by the hotel, not by the hotel. Yeah, by, close by the um, financial training. And I parked the car, and um, I didn't, I'm sorry. I went to the hotel, registered, went back to the car, drove it into the car park. They told me I could drive it into the car park there. And they had an electronic opener, so they opened the door for me. And as I drove in, there on the wall facing me, I'm turning in, on the wall facing me, was this exclusion clause. And I'm thinking to myself, they're thinking, Thornton and Shoe Lane Parking, you can't bring an exclusion clause to my attention after I've registered in the hotel. So I parked my car and I went back to the hotel reception. I said, you know that exclusion clause in the, uh, uh, in the garage? I said, it's no good bringing that to my attention now. I said, it's no good because I'm already in a contract. You can't suddenly introduce new terms into a contract. I'm already in a contract with you. And that should have been brought to my attention as I registered the hotel or desk. And you know, next time I went, I was registering in the hotel. And I look in there, there, behind the hotel desk, there is a notice that says, guests who park their car in the car park are notified that the hotel will not be. They, they, actually got ahead and done it. They've made a notice for reception that said that they would not be liable for damage to guests' cars. Look out for it. It's such fun to see English law in action. It needs to be brought to the attention of the other party. I'm not going to go into these cases. They're fun cases. Look them up. But as you're 
entering into a contract, if there is an exclusion clause, it is only effective if it is brought to your attention at the time, specifically brought to your attention. The hotel receptionist should say, can I bring your attention to this notice here? Can I bring your attention to this notice here behind me and this notice on the wall? And here's a little card with your key card in and inside you'll see all our terms. They should say that. They don't. They should do. Where a document apparently has a legal effect, it's up to you. If, it's, if it has the... If it looks like it's a contract, if it looks like it's terms and conditions, it's up to you to read them. And if you don't, and there are exclusion clauses in there, you should have read that contract. And I, again, I did do when I hired a car. I had a car and, and I took my son in with me and said, now you pay attention to what I do, what the questions I ask. And when they said, you know how you hire a car? And they said, we need to sign there, 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 and there, and there. And you just sign like that, whereabouts, where, there, there, there. And I said, what is it I'm signing? And I nudged my, nudged my son, he was only 10. I nudged him and said, Pinky. I said, what is it I'm signing? And he said, oh, it's, it's just this, this, and this. I said, okay, I'll sign it. If it's just this and this, then I'll sign it. But if it's anything else, then I'm not liable. Because you have told me the oral statement of an employee can negate the effect of a written exclusion clause. And I didn't need it as it turned out, but I got my son as a witness, and there was another couple waiting behind me to. Uh, so I, and I took their number, I took their registration plate, and not, didn't physically say, I made a note of it, so that in the event that anything did happen, and in the event that Barry Van Hyer had chosen to exercise their exclusion clause, then I would have said, no, no, I asked. And I was wrongly told by your employee that these, this, this contract meant this, this, and this. But I didn't need it. But it's nice, isn't it, to be able to do this sort of thing. And why not? It's English law in action. Get used to it. Oral statements, oh dear. There. Oral statements by an employee. Curtis and Chemical Cleaning Company. I'm going to tell you this one because I enjoy this case. Dancer, dance competition. Dress, beautiful dress. Not only was it a beautiful dress, but there were thousands of sequins that she had sewn on. For those of you that don't know what a sequin is, this is a pretty much a life-size one, a life-size image of one. And it's got a little hole at the top there to take the needle and thread. You can press the needle, push the needle through in the thread, and you can sew your sequins on. And they glitter. I was at a nightclub relatively recently in, in southern Greece. Um, and I'm dancing away in this nightclub, and there's the mirror ball going around at the, on the ceiling. And my wife had dressed up specifically, beautifully, in her sequined gown. And there we are doing the doing the dancing on the dance floor. And I was reminded of Curtis and Chemical Cleaning Company because this dancer went in and as she was saying, she's got a stain on her dress and she wanted it clean for the competition at weekend. And she said to the girl, can you, can you do anything for this dress? And the girl said, yeah, I think we can. I, th I think we can sort that out. And the dancer looked behind the girl and said, the cleaning company will not be responsible for any loss or damage to guests' garments, no matter how caused. And so the, the dancer pointed to this and said to the girl, what does this mean? Don't worry about it. She says, that if we can't get the stain out, then that's it, we can't get it out. So when she went back on the Friday to pick the dress up, the stain gone. Perfect. The way she looked, of the 3,000 sequins that she had sewn on, 2,000 of them were missing and 500 more were broken. So she said, my dress is ruined. I'll sue the chemical cleaning company. And the chemical cleaning company said, no. See that notice there? It said, we're not going to be liable 
for any damage to your, your garments, no matter how coarse. She said, I know, but I asked your girl, and your girl said, it just means that if we can't get the stain out, then we can't get the stain out. She didn't say you were going to ruin my sequins. Curtis won. The oral statement of an employee can negate the effectiveness of an exclusion clause. Part of the history of trade, I'm not going to tell you these cases, if they have a history of trade, may be deemed to be aware of the exclusion clause. But it's got to be more than three times in five years. In the case Hardwick and Suffolk, it was actually a hundred times in a three-year period. That's like once every ten days. So we do have a history of trade. This one, the Holly and Ramble Motors, was three times in five years. When they, the motor company damaged Holly's car, they should take them for service. Any ambiguity will be read strictly against the party seeking to rely on it. If you're relying on an exclusion clause, if it's a bit vague, then the one seeking to hide behind the exclusion clause will have it read strictly against them. And if there's any ambiguity or vagueness, I'm sorry, but you can't rely on the exclusion clause. Is it possible, the question, is it possible to have a clause within a contract that exonerates you from blame for total non-performance, total breach, fundamental breach? Not only have you failed to perform what you said you were going to perform, you've actually done worse than that and caused damage. And it was first established in a case it's called the Swiss case and I was wondering whether to give you the title but I like the title the title is the, and I'm not going to write it now so don't worry about it the, the name of the case is the case Swiss Atlantic Societe Damamon Maritime Societe Anonyme and the MV Rotterdam should call them Centrale. And isn't it a good job you don't have to remember the names? It's actually reduced down to the Swiss case. And the Swiss case was a case about something called demurrage. And demurrage is a the topic of damages which are payable where a ship is delayed in port. Ships only make money when they're travelling, when they're on the move. If a ship is, is delayed in a port, it's not, it's not carrying cargo, it's not making any money. So demurrage is where, through no fault of the ship owner, the ship is delayed in port and they're able to claim demurrage if it's within the contract. And the Swiss Atlantic case was about demurrage. It wasn't about fundamental breach and exclusion clauses. But in the case, obito dicta, the um, judge said, I'll explain obito dicta when we get to um, company law. The judge said, I see no reason why you should not be able to exclude liability for total non-performance. And that was the first time that idea had been mooted. And it came up in the case photo productions in Securicor. Securicor are now Group 4, aren't they? Group 4 Securicor, they're called. Had won a contract to provide security services for a film photo, produ photo productions, photo processing company. And the terms of the contract were that Securicor, on an evening basis, every evening at different times, three times a night, they would send a guard round to inspect the premises. And on one of those visits, the guard would go in to the premises and have a look around inside to make sure everything was safe. It also said in the contract the Securicor would not be liable for any loss or damage to photo productions premises, no matter how caused. Securicor sent a night watchman after a few months. Sent a night watchman round. 
unknown to Security Corps, and they hadn't done sufficient, really, checks about this person, unknown to Security, to security Corps, this man was a pyromaniac. He was a known fire lover. He loved a good fire. He couldn't believe his luck when he was assigned to the photo productions job. Imagine the stories he'd be able to tell to his fellow pyromaniacs at the local Fire Lovers Club meeting. Because he knew that film was highly combustible. So on the visit this particular time, he got a waste paper bin and put some old cuttings where they'd been cutting the film and put some cuttings in the bottom of this waste paper bin and he <coughs> dropped a match in. Whoosh! Brilliant! Wonderful! But he realised that that was maybe just a one-off. So at another corner of the warehouse, the production facility, he got another waste bin. Whoosh! By now the first one's really going well. What a blaze! The second one starts going, and he's about to light the third, and he was overcome by the smoke, and his glasses fell off. Now, he was quite myopic, this guy. He stumbled around, but he eventually, his glasses stood on his glasses. He eventually felt his way and found his way to the door and was able to let himself out. But by now, photo production facilities were gone, totally ablaze. And the fire engines arrived and found this man covered in black soot, stumbling around in the car park, wondering where to go because he's not got his glasses, he can't find his car. And it was this Security Corps employee. So now the insurance company for photo productions is suing Security Corps. And Security Corps defending themselves, saying, it says here in our contract that we, Security Corps, will not be long out liable for any loss or damage to our client's premises, no matter how caused. And even though, therefore, it was our employee who burnt down your premises, we are not liable. <laughs> and the court said, what do you think? The court said, yeah, you're not liable. That is an effective exclusion clause. So security corps personnel can burn down the premises of their clients and so long as they have this clause within the contract that they shall not be liable for any loss or damage, no matter how caused, uh, security corps will escape liability. Isn't that a cracker? Let me get to unfair terms legislation. And we'll cover this as well, because I think the next topic is damages or breach of contract, yeah. So we'll, we'll cover this and then we'll close this lecture and start on work. Unfair terms. You'll notice how there are fewer case names now, but there are fewer. Unfair terms. Unfair contract terms simply say, unfair terms in consumer contract regulations of 99. I believe there's another one as well, uh, but they're still effectively based on these. They restrict or limit the extent of liability for negligence in consumer contracts. And the consumer contract is one where one of the parties is not acting in the course of business. So you, when you buy food at the supermarket, you're a consumer. When you buy a car, you're a consumer. But when a motor dealer buys a car from the manufacturer, they're not a consumer. So consumer contracts is where it's the end user that is entering into the contract. Some avoid, others are subject to the test of reasonableness, which is a problem, causes us a problem, because reasonable, in English law, reasonable for a term or a time period typically, should be, action should be brought within a reasonable time. What's a reasonable time? And the judges, the courts have decided that a reasonable time is a time that is reasonable in the circumstances. So that doesn't help. But actually, in the context of unfair terms, reasonable is defined. So terms are all right, so long as they're reasonable. And we have the definition of reasonable according to the Unfair Contract Terms Act. So some avoid, and I'll tell you what that is. 
Some avoid, others are subject to the test of reasonableness. You can't exclude liability for negligence that results in death or personal injury. Remember that. You cannot exclude or limit liability that results for your negligence that results in death or personal injury. It comes up in exam questions more than once. You can't exclude liability for partial or incomplete performance by the seller. If you only get part performance you can't exclude liability for failing to complete. You can't have a term that binds the consumer but it allows the seller to avoid responsibility. So you can't put into your contract something which restricts you, the buyer, from claiming, but it does restrict the seller from liability. That's unfair. So how, now we have reasonable. And reasonableness takes account of, and the big one is relative marketing power. And in that case, photo productions and security card, Two big companies, relative bargaining power. It's not as though one is imposing their might and their strength and their power on some little person. Like it is with consumer contracts. When you're buying, when you're in contract with a top four firm of accountants, when I was in contract with one of the big name tuition providers and I was a subcontractor, they broke a contract. What do I do? Sue? Yes, of course. And when? Yes, of course. Will I get any more work from that person, that, that firm? No. And so it's always a little bit unfair on the, the consumer, the individual, the small person. It takes account also of any inducement offered or normal trade custom. Is it reasonable? Is it the normal practice in the business to, to have this restriction? Yeah, then it's reasonable. It's a special ordered goods rather than out of inventory, out of stock. If they're specially ordered, can you exclude liability? And if they are, and you're trying to exclude liability, that's not fair. Because if they're specially ordered, these are made as a one-off. These are made specifically to a design. It's real unfair. If it's just stock, that would be fair to exclude because it's just your general stuff. But it's not fair to exclude it if it's specifically ordered. It needs to be fair and equitable treatment of the consumer by the seller. So it's consumer rights, the buyer's rights. And finally, the extent of ability to cover by insurance. If the seller is able to insure, if the buyer is able to insure, and then the extent to which it is available to be covered by insurance is taken into account when we're looking at these exclusion clauses. And St Albans City Council and International Computers is one. If you want to look it up, look it up. Again, it's, it's one of these unfair contract terms things. Regulations apply to terms which have not been separately negotiated. Separate negotiation, exclusion clause doesn't apply. A consumer is a natural person gone through that. Unfair terms, any term, of course, is a significant imbalance. Of course, it's unfair. Big person contracting with a little person, that's unfair. You come across that in um, Elton John and Sting, um, Gordon Sumner, and the Macaulay Brothers, and um, think Cliff Richard had one, where budding artists, budding songsters, are signed up by record producing companies and at, at, at terms which are in retrospect unfair but because these are budding artists and it was their first contract and they 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 can't really afford any more tins of beans so they just uh, stony broke and then they discovered and so a record company is able to sign them up for a negligible amount that's unfair and there's been a number, Gordon Sumner, Cliff Richard, I think, Alton John certainly, have sued and asked for their earnings back. And Richard Branson from Virgin Records is one that has had to pay, EMI is another one, have had to pay substantial damages and compensation 
because of these unfair contract terms. And nowadays, these record companies don't just recommend these kids to go and see legal advice. They say, we will pay. We will, we will pay the legal costs. Get advice. Get somebody to assist you in negotiating a contract with us, and we will pay for that legal costs of doing it. So out of their way to make sure that they are scrupulously fair.